Hi there, I'm Lucas and I'm a bit sick, so my voice and my nose do some crazy things today, so please excuse that up front. Um, today I want to show you the new, I think it's rather new, Lilliput A7S field monitor. So this is the Lilliput A7S. Um, field monitor. It's a bit confusing because it's like the same uh, Sony camera, it's also called A7S. Um, but the full name is, as you can see on this crazy nice box here, uh, which is plainly and simple, I like that actually, it's the A7S 4K camera assist. The A7S is a 7 inch monitor, uh, which goes on top of your camera. Um, it is 4K capable, it does not have a 4K panel of course, not at this price point. Um, but it can accept signals in real 4K. So basically you can feed it up into the monitor and you can still um, benefit from your whole display. So if you, for example, use a GH5 as I do, um, you can use the full signal for your monitoring purposes. The panel itself now is, is slightly larger than full HD. So this is a real benefit. You have a real full HD monitor in this seven inch. So it's 1920 by 1200 pixels because it's uh, 16 by 10, not 16 by nine. Um, this is a bit strange for most people, I think, because we usually only shoot 16 by nine, but this can be helpful with additional um, stuff that we can show on our monitor here. Now let's talk about the build. So this monitor is made of plastic and not of metal. Um, usually, you know that um, I like things to be rocked and heavy and, and, and things that can take a punch. In case of monitors though, I really like when they are light because they go on top of your camera, go on top of your rig or wherever, and usually these are positions where weight is not um, an advantage, more of a disadvantage. And this monitor now is really light. The finish is nice, you don't have like big gaps or something, it's um, well built um, and it's light and goes on your camera very well. So we only have one input on this monitor and this is HDMI. So we only have a full sized HDMI input and an output because you can pass through your signal through this monitor. So if you have a second monitor or I don't know what you want to do maybe with the, the signal, um, you can chain it through. Um, the other connection that we have is um, a normal uh, audio jack for headphones for monitoring audio quite handy I never used this before but it can be quite handy I think and we have here the space for the battery plate we get to this in a minute on top and on the bottom we have a 1 4th inch thread to get it on our rig and also on top I don't know if you can read the text here we have four buttons and a wheel the first button is for uh, switching it on and off and we have two function keys because this monitor, you have to know, is, has a few cool, nice features that we can assign freely onto these two function buttons. An exit button, which is mainly interesting for the menu, and we have the wheel. And the wheel is also uh, used to navigate um, through the menus and also it can be pushed to get into the menu. But we get into the menu stuff in a second. So when you usually see uh, images of this monitor online, it's not naked like I have it here. Um, I just do this like so you can see it a bit better. Um, usually it comes with, with this great um, red uh, yeah, condom thing. Um, so let's put it on here. Uh, so this makes it a bit more rugged and uh, also it looks quite cool, I think. So this is like how the, the monitor looks in, in nature, usually. So we have buttons on top, now you can read them also a bit better, I think. Um, so we get we can access anything that we need, also the, the, the threads. Now also we have a like nice um, scratch protection for the monitor. We can reach perfectly the um, HDMI in and out. Also now it's like written on the on the side, we can read it better. Uh, the headphone jack and of course also the AC um, adapter position. And obviously we can reach the battery also very well. So I think this is silicon and uh, with this cover we also have like a little um, essential sun hood around our monitor. Which doesn't help as much. But what we do have here is we have velcro in here. I think this is a pretty good moment to talk about what's in the box. So again this is the box. I like it when it's like uh, simple and minimal. Um, the first thing that is interesting for us in this box is um, the real sun hood. So we have the sun hood and it's quite easy to just uh, get it in here. So just with the velcro we attach it and then we have a pretty large, pretty long sun hood which 
covers the, the monitor perfectly. So this is really great to shoot into the sun. And it's also in already included into the monitor uh, package. So we get one of these little hot shoe mounts f f uh, to put the, the monitor on top of our camera directly. You can not see it probably, but it has a very nice metal finish and is an, a much better mini ball head than you usually get. We get an HDMI cable. This is from a full-size HDMI, which goes into the monitor of, I think this is mini, not micro HDMI. It's not that useful for me because um, my GH5 camera has also a full-size HDMI connection. However, as uh, HDMI cables cost next to nothing, this is not really a problem. We get a little user guide. Um, always handy. And last but not least, the battery plate. So this battery plate is made for Sony NPF batteries, but there's an, uh, I think it's an optional purchase, um, a battery plate for Canon's LPE6 batteries, which are the usual batteries for the 60s, 50s and uh, 60D and 70D camera. So that's quite cool. It goes on the back of our monitor and then we have like this little uh, security switch. And with this enabled, we cannot detach the battery plate again until we lose it and then we can switch it. Um, I don't have any MPF batteries lying around, this is a problem usually, uh, because I never uh, use um, external power uh, for, uh, like with batteries for these monitors. I usually only use the DC input uh, from a battery plate. But still, it's a very nice option to have this, and uh, Sony NPF batteries are also not that expensive, I think, when you buy the aftermarket ones. And I think you will be able to power them, uh, this monitor, pretty long with these. Let's talk a bit about the operation. Um, on the DC input, it's always listed as 12 volts. Also in the manual, it's listed as 12 volts. However, um, the manufacturer of Lilliput claims that um, the, uh, this monitor accepts a wide variety of ranges of voltages that you can plug in into the monitor from 7 to up to 24 volts, which is a quite a good range. And um, I'm not like the heroic guy who tests every voltage he can with monitors just to see if they break. But uh, I can assure you, now I have like a, a V-mount battery here with, um, with this little plate and I have the output of 7.2 volts coming out of it. And with 7.2 volts, this monitor will run just fine, which is uh, pretty neat. So um, I guess 24 volts will also uh, work then. I don't have any 24 volt source, only like up to 12 volts. It's pretty nice because you can uh, use a variety of uh, powering options. So now I have hooked up the monitor directly to the GH5, which is underneath it, um, but we will concentrate on only on the monitor. Um, you know that, that, that filming displays can sometimes be a hassle, so hopefully um, you can see everything properly. So what you cannot see now because of the, the placement of the camera and the angle and blah 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 is the buttons on the top and I will tell you what I will press. So um, for now, let's. Uh, I will just twist on the wheel. When we twist the wheel, we get directly into the brightness controls. Now you have to see that the brightness controls here are not like the illumination of the display itself, it's um, like the brightness uh, wheel in any NLE that you might have. And it's not your typical, you, you wouldn't want that because it also changed the contrast a lot. You can see this when I pump this up, uh, the darker parts get really bright and usually this is not what we would want. Um, when we are in this mode uh, and we have like the brightness also detected, when we press the wheel, we get into the contrast, we can count it for the brightness stuff. Saturation is the next one we press it, tint, and sharpness. I have it to zero, you can of course crank it up like you would want it to. And volume. Volume is the thing, I have this on zero because this monitor does not only have like the output on the audio jack, it also has like little uh, speakers in it. And I, I found this distracting because this is why I set it off. So uh, let's get this route again because it uh, set itself off. So we get the tin sharpness volume and actually that's it. So this is the last point. We have our two function keys and um, for example what I have on the function keys, function one has peaking for me. So this is now from the monitor, you can see this because also the UI elements of the, of the camera are uh, highlighted by the peaking. As you can see it works quite well when I uh, focus the lens. Um, the peaking works really great. You can see this greatly here on the barcode as it 
gets more sharp, it gets way more traction. So the second function that I have here is false colors, which I really love for exposing an image, right? I think this is the same color scheme that we have on Marshall monitors. Um, but still, um, this is a tremendously helpful um, view. And now let's get into the menu. So I will press the wheel once and then we get into the menus. Now we can scroll through all the points that we have here. And when we want to enter a menu, we hit the uh, wheel again. Now we can, it's the same always as always. So you like, you want to adjust the brightness, you get on it and click the wheel again. And now we can adjust the brightness. So, and if I press it again, I get out. And uh, we have the color temperature set here. Um, we can change it also to user, so we can calibrate it like we want it. Um, if we wanted to, I usually leave it at 6,500 uh, Kelvin. I did not calibrate it yet, the monitor. Something we could still do with this option. Uh, and now if you wanted to get out of the menu, uh, the sub-menu, we have to press the exit button. And then we get out and can get to the next one. Um, so now uh, we have a few things here for, uh, for our preview. This is the marker menu. So we have a center marker that we can head on and off. You can see it here, um, how we can, how it pops in. We have an aspect marker um, and you can see I already had that on. So basically we can get ourselves um, aspect, aspect ratio helps, which is quite cool, especially like for the scope stuff. Um, we have the safety markers. Um, where we can like, uh, could define something like a title action safe kind of stuff. Uh, and we can set it to different sizes. Um, I think I will usually let this off. The marker color can be set. This is quite nice. Uh, so it's not necessarily white. We can also turn it red, black, blue, green. Uh, we have a grid. Of course, cannot go without a grid. Um, I'm not the huge fan of the grid actually, but um, can use it and uh, something that's also pretty cool oh sorry is the marker matte because when we press this we can darken down for our preview so basically I can say that I only want the markers I only want it for reference for guidance but we can also like tune it down so okay now it's it's grayish now we know there's nothing to get here or we can turn it really black to not be distracted from it which is kind of nice actually. I like this feature. And the thickness is like for the marker itself or the marking lines, uh, how thick they are. I think the default of two is pretty nice though. So let's get into the next menu, function menu. Um, well, let, let's skip this for now because this is my favorite menu actually. Uh, the waveform menu. Now, now don't let this distract you. It's, uh, this monitor does not feature waveforms, unfortunately. Uh, the, the menu is only called um, uh, waveform. So we have peaking on off. Uh, I already showed you the on uh, the peaking. Right, leave it on for now. We can also change the peaking color. Quite nice. Um, I like red in this case. The peaking level. Uh, this is like the detection ratio of the peaking. So the higher we get it, the less it's uh, likely to to pump in the peaking which is quite nice because we can crank it really high here, as you can see. Um, so like, it's like, like a nice thing for calibration. I will like keep it down again so you can uh, see it better. Uh, false color, we also saw that. Um, pretty neat to have it. Exposure uh, is actually nothing else than a zebra. So we can put on the zebra, you can see it here. And also, we can uh, change the level of the exposure again. So like you can see it here on the, on the, in the wood in the background, um, how we can uh, calibrate this to work. And this is pretty neat because on this, like this, we can also um, properly calibrate it to work in any lock profile. Usually when we shoot something, um, it's uh, when we shoot something in lock, it's not that easy to, to uh, do the same kind of exposure stuff because uh, things work a bit differently where the white point is, in, uh, etc. So with this, we can really calibrate it to the level that we need um, for the way we shoot things. And also we have a histogram directly from the monitor, which goes, and this is what I meant earlier, which also goes into the black border part of the 16 by 10 image. So it goes into the forest edge. So the menu uh, sets itself off quite 
fast, so let's turn this off for now. Um, then we have the volume, of course, uh, we can also um, display ourselves audiometers. I now have like the audiometers from the camera, but now we can also get audiometers from the monitor. Uh, I think this can be quite useful. Um, I usually don't use this, but uh, it's nice to have, always. It's great when you have features like that you don't have to use. Uh, and then we have the system, uh, we can change languages between English and Chinese. Uh, so uh, the OSD timer, this is what, uh, maybe let's put it to 30 seconds for now. Uh, image flip, of course, if you are on a steady cam or something. No, this is, ah, you can switch it in like any direction. This is pretty neat. Uh, anything that you desire can be set here. And the backlight. The backlight is what uh, should be changed when you want to adjust the, the, uh, the brightness. The problem is that it's already set by default to 100, but we can also dim it down when you're in a really dark environment. I usually would leave it at 100, um, to be fair. Um, and here we can also set the F keys. So the F1 key calibration for me is peaking, and uh, we can of course set it to other things. We could set it also to histogram, exposure, level meter, center marker, things like that. And uh, also freeze frame, we will get to that in a second. Uh, I will let's set it back to peaking. This is what I prefer. And reset, of course, is like the factory reset. Now let's talk about the um, function um, menu. Uh, because uh, here are some hidden gems in for our uh, for the um, for uh, the functionality of this monitor. So the 30 seconds is not enough. I, I just noticed. So let's get back to the function menu. Um, the main thing that I really like here is the scan type and aspect. So we can like set it to pixel to pixel, or whatever, uh, zoom and so on and so forth, so like this would um, show me a zoom of the image so I can use the actual 4K image that I, that I get into this thing. I leave it at aspect usually and then I can set the aspect ratio. Now this is where, where uh, I talk about hidden uh, features because this is not really communicated through, um, the, the, uh, through the manufacturer. Because when I set the aspect to, to scope, as you can see here, um, you can see, I turn off the peaking, um, that my complete image gets stretched into a 2.35 uh, by 1 image. And this is of course not really useful in most cases, uh, because it also like distorts the, the UI from the camera. But when you shoot an anamorphic lens, usually this becomes really helpful. I mean the G5 now has um, integrated options to de-squeeze the image for, for viewing purposes. But if you don't have a GH5 or you don't want to use this, this function, you can use this monitor to de-squeeze the image for you. I will show you in a second. So you can also squeeze your 16x9 image to 4x3 and then it also uses the full height of the display. So not only the 16x9 area but the 16x10 area, which is really quite handy. Um, so this will like squeeze it. When we turn it to full, it will use the full image, like it will squeeze it up a bit, in this case by 16 by 9 image, so you don't have the black borders. I usually want to keep it at 16 by 9 when I don't have an anamorphic on. Underscan, check field, things like that. Freeze um, is, now we have a freeze frame. When I get in front of the camera, nothing happens. Um, this is cool for uh, when you uh, set up a frame, so you want to show your actor how he looks like in the light, you can just like get this to freeze frame and then uh, show him and make it off. You don't have to take a photo or throw a video clip or something like that, it's pretty cool. And the DSLR function, I think this is interesting when you like, okay, ah, you can set it to 5D, 5.3 or off. So this is the typical Canon problem that we had before when the HDMI didn't output proper HD signal over the whole time. So hopefully you can uh, properly see this and now put on an anamorphic lens with a factor of 1.33 onto the camera. So you can see things are a bit squeezed. It's not too exciting with this lens. It's not that visible. Still, let's go to the function menu. Set the aspect now to um, not full but to, uh, well, where is it? There, there we have it. To scope. If you want to see it later. Now we have a deep stretched image. 
You can see the time code again here. You can see with the time code, it's a bit like the stretch two. Still, um, we have a pretty nice uh, anamorphic D stretch right on our monitor, which is pretty neat to have. Now I was obviously curious about the quality of the display itself. A quick check in HCFR shows us that the display actually exceeds the proclaimed brightness of 500 nits and is a tiny bit brighter. Not only that, also the colors are really evenly distributed, something that I really did not expect from this little monitor, especially not at this price point. So this is it, the Lilliput A7S 4K camera assist uh, field monitor. And I think it's a pretty good monitor, of course, it's, um, you, you know that I'm, I'm usually more into 5 inch monitors, but this one, as it is so light um, and so, so well built, um, I don't mind it that much that it's a bit larger than I usually like it to. Also, um, I really like the panel, it's like a really nice crisp panel. It looks very good. Um, of course, some features are missing. This is not confusing at this price point, obviously, because like it's not a super um, high-end uh, and uh, expensive monitor. Some things like like waveform, for example, is something that I really would like to see in a cheaper monitor. However, as I'm a GF5 shooter, it's not that. A, that bad for me because I usually already have like the waveform integrated into the camera but people with other cameras can of course not benefit from it. Still things like like peaking and um, and false colors are something that are really valuable for anyone uh, shooting video. Um, so I can just leave you with the recommendation for this little monitor. I, um, I'm quite happy with it. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you next time and uh, soon and hopefully I get like a little bit less sick so I can do more videos again. And yeah, uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, bye.